Loka, thank you very much for being with us. So tell us about the India Climate Collaborative. What is it? What does it do? When was it set up and why? Sure, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so the India Climate Collaborative was launched officially in Jan 2020, so you can imagine sort of trial by fire. Mm -hmm. But um, we're essentially a platform, you could even call us an ecosystem enabler, and the idea is to really mobilize funding towards climate action in India. But we focus primarily on the philanthropic ecosystem, so we're really attempting to build the field of climate philanthropy in India. Um, we also seek to bridge the climate action ecosystem, and mm -hmm. I think that's something that we discovered right at the start of building the ICC, that you had government, business, philanthropy, civil society, um, all working in silos. And the Indian um, climate ecosystem was also not necessarily embedded in the global conversation around climate. So mm. you have you know, a really sort of strong agenda that's being set by the global north, but global south leadership narrative building around how we choose to address the climate mm. challenge is largely absent. Mm. And so we felt that there was a tremendous leadership opportunity for India, not just nationally, but across the region in how we choose to drive action towards you know, climate change. Um, and philanthropy was largely absent from that conversation. This was being led primarily by business interests. Government, of course, has its um, you know, agenda that it's been promoting, um, and it is doing a tremendous job. But there was this very strong component of core civil society action and philanthropy that was just not prevalent. And we felt that that was a very big mistake. And, and why is that important? I mean, in India as well as how it's played out uh, internationally? So philanthropic capital is unlike any other. It's patient, it's flexible, uh, it can deal with complexity. I always say that its currency is complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, So when you're looking at sort of building the foundational pieces, really in empty spaces where markets don't exist, where policies don't exist, in order to do that work, to drive policies where they need to go, you have to, as I said, build those building blocks. You need research, you need data, you need knowledge products, you need um, pilots to demonstrate you know, what action could be like at scale only philanthropic capital can fill those gaps. So I always say it's a tiny drop in the ocean in the sense mm. that it's never going to match public resources, it's never going to match private capital, but what it can do in terms of catalytic impact, no other capital can do. And what's a good example? So the multiplier or the catalytic impact that yeah. you've talked about, either here or elsewhere? Oh, there are many examples. Mm. I think, you know, when you look at sort of what's happening globally with the Kigali Cooling Initiative, that's a wonderful example about, you know, how they're building coal storages, for instance, with the farmer value chain. Mm. To really think about how, as we sort of, you know, build energy systems, um, we really need to, again, you know, demonstrate pilots, um, use sort of renewable energy and, and drive those transformations mm. forward across some of these supply chains. Within India, you know, renewable energy itself is a great example. You know, as a market, we're the largest globally today. Mm. But when we began, it was really, you know, philanthropic capital that was driving research in institutions like Terry, et cetera, that then resulted in the policies that drove renewable energy mm. um, and that growth. So that's what we need to see. We're seeing it, as I said, with, you know, markets like RE and mobility now, but we're not seeing it in, you know, agriculture or food systems or even the freight market, you know. So we have a long way to go, but this is again where philanthropic capital can mm. really lead decarbonization. Mm. Another example, one of the things that we've just done actually is recently um, the Climate Group launched the uh, Net Zero Steel Initiative mm. for India. So we actually seed funded that initiative mm. for India. And the idea really was, can we build a platform where we aggregate steel consumers and we build market demand for net zero steel? But that's a basic building block, right? How are you going to sort of drive those transformations if you don't have that kind of um, ecosystem that's being built? That again is philanthropic So in capital. the case of Net Zero, was it specifically funded by someone or? Uh... No, it was funded by the India Climate Collaborative okay. as a whole. Uh, we're a multi-stakeholder platform, so we actually consist of you know over 30 uh, domestic philanthropies and foundations as well as international funders. Um, and the idea really is to, as I said, ensure that you know we're, we're building um, that momentum around climate action in India through grant capital and driving it where it needs to go. A lot of the work, I keep joking that, you know, we're building um, the we're, we're building an airplane as we're flying it mm. because it is sort of such nascent work, right? Sure. You know, the field of climate philanthropy is something that's really come up in the last few years. It hasn't existed before. Philanthropic capital in India is really low in terms of the actual spend per year. We don't even have the right figures around this because mm. it's not called climate mm. philanthropy. Mm. Um, very often you'll find foundations are funding sort of areas that are adjacent to climate. Mm. 
So they're funding areas like agriculture or livelihoods or rural development. Um, and they're, they have massive climate impacts, but they're not you know, necessarily quantifying those impacts or risk proofing their programs. The other challenge that we've seen is taxonomy. When you say climate and I say climate, it's not often the same thing. So how do we build even that common base of knowledge around what we're sort of talking about when we talk about the climate challenge? That in itself has been sort of just a very core piece of groundwork that we've started doing over here. Many examples, but these are just a few. Sure, and, and if you were to think of the three things that you're focused on right mm. now as priorities, what would they be? Uh, mobilizing funding, I think that's an overarching priority. Sure, yeah. I think along with that, what we're trying to do is develop the pipeline of solutions. So, um, you know, that's something, of course, that a lot of other folks are doing. But when it comes to grant capital and nonprofit specifically, that's really where our, you know, major focus mm. is. Um, over time, we hope to grow to impact capital. But, you know, there are a lot of partners who are working in that ecosystem already. Um, so surfacing the pipeline of solution, I think along with that, it's not just who's doing what, it's what is a good climate solution versus a bad one. Mm. And you have to templatize that for India right now. You know, that's a huge entry barrier for funders. The second is building leadership. So along with the monetary component, what we've realized is a huge vacuum in India is um, climate champions. They don't exist. Why don't we have more Bill Gates who, you know, sort of speak from the Indian perspective, who are leading on advocacy around climate action? Um, that's a gap that we're trying to fill. But what we found again is there's tremendous potential. Um, there are, you know, industrialists, philanthropists who are thinking deeply about this problem, but they need to be capacitated mm. um, as to how to sort of approach this problem from an India specific lens and an India first lens that doesn't exist. <clears throat> um, the list is long, but I'll, I'll pause here. I think those are some of the sort of top priorities for us right now. Right. And, you know, so I'm assuming you've met funders of all kinds, both mm -hmm. internationally and here. So what's the one or two things you see different between uh, funders, let's say, on maybe the West Coast yep. uh, versus, let's say, funders here? And what could change their approach if it were to? That's a brilliant question and I'm so glad you asked that because one of the big sort of things that we're realizing is sort of true within the philanthropic ecosystem between the global north and the global south is sort of a microcosm of what's true between the global north and global south as a whole, which is this whole conversation between mitigation and adaptation, mm. right? Mitigation being sort of future carbon emissions and how to solve for that and adaptation being, you know, dealing with the very real effects of climate change here and now. And it's traditionally been this binary where the global south will say, look, we have you know, millions of vulnerable communities who are dealing with these impacts. We have to talk about adaptation. It's historically completely underfunded globally. And the global north will say, well, you know, we have to talk about emissions because if we don't, we'll be adapting forever. Mm. Um, what we're realizing today, and this is what we're trying to do through the ICC, is break that binary. We don't need to talk in such black and white terms between mitigation and adaptation. They're as important, and in fact, the programs and projects that you end up building out, or the solutions rather, um, they have to be ground up, they have to have components of you know, adaptation, and we do need to factor in mitigation. Agriculture is a great example, mm. right? Like, it has tremendous mitigation potential. Mm. You know, just as it does, of course, have these core benefits of looking at, you know, livelihood and income generation and adaptive components that you have to prepare for as well. So I think the conversation has to be more holistic. And again, this is a big leadership opportunity for the Global South because we need to direct it um, in this way. Right. And what is it that, I mean, even in the small numbers that you're dealing with, you're, you are saying that you're sensing a change in India right. in terms of people. So what's changing that if, I mean, I'm sure your work is contributing but what's changing that and what could change it further in, and I'm talking about specifically contribution to uh, uh, climate philanthropy gosh I hope our work is contributing because <laughs> otherwise I should I should sort of just you know resign but um, I think you know again it's a really pertinent question and I think this it's actually it comes down to a sense of agency uh, it comes down to it comes down to agency in the sense that you know we need to make sure that um, philanthropists and those who are sort of who we're looking to in terms of who control sort of capital flows feel that they have an opportunity to actually solve the problem that they can be part of the problem I think in India it's interesting there's no climate denial mm. people will never say yeah. climate change is not real but they they do say it's not their problem mm. or they do say they don't know why it's something they should have to solve the government should be looking at it and that's not at all how we need to be thinking about climate action. Climate action is everything under the realm of sustainable development or economic development today. 
And the second thing that I would say is really important here in India is ensuring that the conversation is inclusive, it's ground up, it has to be representative of you know communities across the board. And that's, I think, an opportunity again for philanthropy to lead, given its extensive you know credibility, uh, networks on the ground with grassroots organizations. It really like holds that narrative, you know, in a way that no other sure. sector of society does. Right. So you talked about the pipeline yeah. and uh, how things are surfacing, and uh, and then there is you know, the future. So how do you uh, and, and what are you thinking in terms of uh, marrying this pipeline or what flows out of it or is flowing out of it with the capital that's coming in and the opportunity that there is? Um, you could uh, use an example if you want. Right. So I think one of the things we're trying to do is actually we're building a marketplace. So mm. the ICC is building, um, you know, a climate solutions platform where we're seeking to drive, um, or, you know, funding um, towards, let's say, the best in class projects across the country. And that's a hand that we're playing very heavily. We will be curating, we will be doing due diligence and in the selection of these projects. But again, the idea is surface CSOs and civil society organizations build the capacity of these organizations to absorb and receive this funding and in that way educate and capacitate funders as well so that they know when they talk about water these are the x number of mm. solutions uh, in terms of what that landscape is and how important they are and these are the organizations working across those geographies different ticket sizes etc so trying to just simplify that process sure. and build in those efficiencies for both CSOs and funders. And, and what's the area that at this point of time seems to resonate the most with your funding community? I'll be honest, mm. it's definitely on the adaptation side because as I said, historically that mm. is where philanthropy has played mm. sort of the largest role in, in those related areas. We need funding from philanthropy to go, to go towards mitigation. It is absolutely underfunded. We are building out cities, we are urbanizing rapidly, we are going to lock ourselves into high carbon development pathways if we're not careful, and that is going to create further complications for the very communities we're seeking to protect. So it is a learning journey for funders, um, but mitigation is where we need to go. Right, so last couple of questions. So the first is, what made you choose climate as a passion project or a project? Um, great question. I actually, you know, I used to be a journalist in my, you know, sort of previous life. Um, but I think what happened was just sort of, I, I've always been someone who's um, been very intrinsically sort of um, linked to nature. So it has played a very large sort of role in my life. My family, my dad's side of the family are all wildlife conservationists. And I think I just, for me personally, I saw those places around me um, disappearing. You know, nature was becoming sort of a, a lesser and lesser component in our overall daily lives, and they felt very threatened, those spaces. And so the climate conversation really came to me. And then there was this opportunity to build out this collaborative and really sort of shift into this trajectory, and that's, that's how I ended up. Right, so last question. So what do you hope to take away from uh, an event or a gathering like this? Um, I think just sort of new ideas, um, thought leadership is always something that you know comes out of these kind of gatherings. Um, you always discover things that you never knew, and I think climate is an area where you're constantly learning, even if you know you you think you know, you never do. Um, and I think also the opportunity to sort of bridge that ecosystem, right? Like as I said, it's very siloed. Um, we're not actually having a broad-based discussion in the way that we need to. And I think the other thing that we're very guilty of in the climate community is we're gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. We tend to be gatekeepers, you know, we're not very inclusive. I think convenings like this, as I said, bring in, um, you know, actors from many, many different sectors. Um, and that that's an essential component to solving the crisis. You have to build out those systemic opportunities and conversations. Right. That's a good note to end on. Thank you so much. Shruka. Thank you.